Hello everyone, my name is Brian and welcome back to Barb's Basement. Man, it feels good to be able to sit back down and actually work on a Barb's Basement video. So for those of you who don't know, I actually work in video production as my nine to five job. And since I'm self-employed, a lot of that just falls on me. So unfortunately I haven't had a ton of time to work on stuff for Barb's Basement. Like real life has started to kick back up again. Video production has started to like come in just wave after wave and I've actually been spending a lot of my time out of state so I've not been able to just sit down and use any of my free time to work on Barb's Basement stuff. Unfortunately when I get done with like a long day of video production I sit down and I just want to shut my brain off and play some slow tour and maybe work out or eat a bunch of junk food or just hang out with my friends or my fiance or do whatever. But unfortunately I have been captured by Barb once again. As the world becomes more and more crazy by the second I start to suspect that maybe the basement isn't so bad. Maybe these four walls and concrete floors are actually going to be my saving grace. Reality is a nightmare and Star Wars comics are my only relief from this hellscape that we inhabit. So this week we're going to start off where it all began for Zane, on a planet familiar to KOTOR fans, Dantooine. Walking towards the temple grounds, we see the Jedi Master Vandar speaking with Zane's mother. She says that Zane has been in the temple all morning and she is anxious to find out what's to become of her little baby boy. Quick sidebar, so Vandar speaks like everyone else does, so does that mean that Yoda just speaks in reverse just to throw people off, or is it a speech impediment? So does that mean this whole time that Yoda has been fooling us all? Did Yoda do Benghazi? Master Vandar tells Zane's mother that the Jedi Knight who brought Zane to the temple was correct. Zane has a marginal force connection. She shouldn't let that bother her though. Despite the Jedi studying the force for thousands upon thousands of years, they still aren't totally sure how the force manifests in younglings. With some training, Zane may one day become a useful Jedi. The Master of the Temple already admires Zane for how easily he bonds with his fellow younglings. His mother tells the Jedi Master that he's had a lot of practice. He has four siblings at home. More importantly, she wants to know if her son will actually be safe with the Jedi. Keep in mind that it wasn't too long ago that Exar Kun had turned to the dark side and ignited a war with the Republic. If a beloved and famous knight like Exar Kun can fall, no Jedi is safe. She wants to know if they are gone for good. Master Vandar assures her that they have been free of the Sith ever since the end of the war. Ever since then, they have remained vigilant to fight against their return. He tells her that her son couldn't be more safe. Man, it's a real bummer seeing all of his friends as younglings being carefree. You know, since they all get murdered, like to death, like 100% dead. After all, they're not just their teachers, they're their protectors. Wit to Zane running from his murderous protectors as his childhood friends lay lifeless on the temple floor. Before Zane can make it to the elevator, his masters call out to him, telling him that he was never one for punctuality. Zane should spare them some time and surrender. Zane, in defiance, ignites his lightsaber. Lucian answers in kind. Instead of fighting the rogue Jedi Masters, he slashes the lift and leaps into the shaft. As Zane flees, Lucian tells the control tower to go into complete lockdown. The other Masters leap after the surviving Padawan as he uses his lightsaber to slow his fall. Zane cuts a hole in the lift's door and sets off on foot, with Lucian nipping at his heels. Weaving through the dock droids, he spots an escape route. Demonstrating his immense force ability, Lucian force pushes all the droids out of his way. As they explode, Zane dives into an air duct. Back at the speeder, Griff is still trying to escape his Duracell cuffs. Not knowing the situation, Griff calls out to the Jedi Masters, telling them that Zane has violated all of his civil rights. After Zane hops onto the speeder bike, Griff asks if all the Jedi Masters are after him. Zane regretfully tells Griff that they are in fact chasing him down. Confused, he asks what Zane did, but there is no time to explain. All that he can say is that he didn't do anything wrong. As Zane and Griff speed off, Lucian shouts out that the bay doors are closed, that there is no escape. As Zane accelerates, Master Reyna leaps at the speeder, slicing at the duo and in the process cutting off the speeder's sidecar, missing Griff by a pubic hair. In possibly one of the most wizard moves, Zane takes his speeder up into the lifts and zips up through the temple, smashing out the window and escaping. Hell yeah. Extreme. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not so extreme and 10 being extremely extreme, I give this a 9.5! <laughs> Before the pair can relax, the masters are still giving chase, hopping onto speeders of their own. Cut to a peaceful classroom. A nice elderly teacher is giving his lessons on traffic control to his eager young students. Then, whammo! Zane and Griff crash through the classroom as Zane tells them to get back to their studies. This is Jedi business. Before they can even cope with the trauma of their near-death experience, the Jedi masters crash through the classroom as well once again telling the students to go back to their studies. This is Jedi business. Hopping off their speeders, the masters grill some of the students, asking a Rodian student, 
what they saw. But this Rodian ain't no snitch, and he knows not to talk to Jedi. As the Jedi get irritated by the lack of answers, a student goes to dump his trash into the garbage. Little do they know, our wayward heroes are hiding in the trash compactor. Griff asks who the master was that tore through their speeder. Zane says it was Jedi Master Reyna Tay, which rhymes with run away, which is what they should be doing right about now. As the students discard their trays, the two fall all the way down to the bottom. Zane is both literally and figuratively at rock bottom. Finally having a moment to speak, Griff starts to grill Zane. Why would the Master chasing him if he was their intern? Zane tries to defend himself, telling Griff that the Jedi had betrayed and killed their Padawans. All of his friends are dead. Now that they are dead, they are trying to cover their tracks by killing Zane as well. Griff, being the Master Sleuth, wants nothing to do with this. He didn't sign up for this and starts to trudge off. But before he can make it too far, his interest is piqued. He wants to know, how can he be sure that Zane didn't actually kill those Padawans? Zane shudders at the accusation. He could have never killed them. They were his friends. As he pleads with Griff, he puts his hands on his shoulders to try and reassure him, giving Griff the chance to swipe the Padawan's lightsaber, igniting it. Igniting it, he tells Zane to get back. He needs some time to think. Zane pleads with him, basically telling him that he isn't even good enough of a Jedi to capture Griff, let alone killing all those promising Jedi students. How many times did he try to capture Griff? They were all basically already Jedi. He couldn't have killed one of them, let alone all of them. As Zane is deep in mourning, Griff winds back the lightsaber, ready to strike, slicing right through a probe droid. Griff, handing Zane his lightsaber back, tells him that it's no longer just the Jedi that are after him. This is a civil authority droid. He is boned. Despite everything that has happened, Zane and Griff have basically always had a friendly rivalry. Griff feels bad for the young Jedi intern, and he knows that he couldn't hurt anyone. He couldn't even catch Griff. Somewhere deep down, he has sympathy for the young man. Zane asks how he knows the droid was searching for them. It could have been just because they hit the building. Griff gives the Jedi a reality check. This city is rough, and the authorities don't care about minor traffic collisions. Although I would argue that destroying an entire classroom full of bright young minds is more than just a minor traffic collision. <laughs> Despite all of this, he tells Griff that it's a big planet. If Griff wanted to, he could escape. On the hollow net, they are blasting Zane's face, calling him a failed Padawan, he slew his classmates, and is now a fugitive who is armed and deranged. Zane, dropping to his knees, tells Griff that he should just run away and that he shouldn't get wrapped up in all of this. Griff is obviously eager to take him up on this offer, but he is also out of luck. They have his name blasting all over Terrace as well. The news calls Griff an accessory, but Griff is less offended that he's implicated in the murder of children, and he's more upset at the notion that he isn't the mastermind in the plan. Back at the temple, the bodies of the dead Padawans are being carried out. The constables contact the Jedi Masters to let them know that they're searching for the rogue Jedi Zane Carrick. Quinelia is unsure if this is a good idea to bring outsiders to such a sensitive matter. This would threaten whatever scheme they are cooking up. Lucian, however, always knew that it was inevitable that the authorities would be involved in some way, shape, or form. He told their contacts and Coruscant the same thing. It was always expected. I mean, come on, they killed kids. Of course the authorities are going to be involved in some way. Quinelia agrees that Lucian is right. She just never thought that Zane would be the one to survive. Lucian argues that he still may not be the one. At least he doesn't think that he is. But they have to make sure that he isn't. Quinelia isn't sure that they will be able to hunt Zane down. They may know his mind, but they know very little about the Sniven. Lucian assures her that the Sniven is more than likely out for himself. They may have already split up as they speak. Zane is very much alone, and he will crawl into the darkest hole that he can possibly find. They will help the constable bury him there. Meanwhile, in the lower city, Griff and Zane are hiding in plain sight. They are in a Keterozan pub. After a long shift to the mines, Keterozans can't see past their own noses for hours. To them, they are just tall blur and short blur. If the news starts broadcasting smell, then they will be in some trouble. They are showing the families of the deceased Padawans, including Shell, the sister of his best friend, and coincidentally, his crush. She will never speak to Zane again, since she thinks that he killed her brother. Griff decides to give him the old cheer up their champ speech telling Zane that she can't possibly believe that he killed them. Like he said, he's a terrible Jedi. If Zane wasn't the worst Jedi of all time, it's only because the next guy down blew up all the records of his failures when he blew up whatever planet he was on. They can probably actually prove how much he sucks in a court of law. Just as he goes to pat Zane in the back, he pushes him to the floor, telling him to duck. Peeking over the counter, Marn can't tell if they are Jedi, but they can for sure see. There will definitely be bounties on their heads, and everyone who has eyes will be trouble. Griff tries to see the bright side of the situation. This will do wonders for his street cred with the Vulcans. Always an optimist. Zane uses the force to break a glass. Griff tells the Padawan to be careful. These people may be blind, but they aren't deaf. Zane doesn't care. How could the Masters do this to them? They trusted them, and all they got for it was these lousy lightsaber wounds. Griff, calling on his Wikipedia knowledge, says that maybe the Masters were actually Bith. Zane is obviously confused and asks him if he means Sith. Griff isn't going to get caught up in the technicalities. He just knows they ruined all the trade routes with their war. Zane says there is no way they are Sith. He has been with them for years, and they have always hated the Sith. And just like that, a light bulb goes off. They hate the Sith an emotion the Jedi are never supposed to feel. Something is off about all of this. 
What had the younglings seen? Where had they been? What did they learn from the masters? What are they afraid of? Zane, determined to discover the secrets of the masters, tells Griff that he has to get them off world. They have to go where he was trained. Not only that, he has to retrace their entire lives under their former masters. Their only way out of the situation is to find out what motivated their masters. Griff agrees, the only way to go up is at first to go down. And they are going all the way down. Down to the underworld of Terrace. Hopefully Zane likes freaks and disease. Their way off Terrace is in the Undercity. Fade to the Jedi Temple, Zamar has tapped into the force and discovers our hero's escape plan, whispering to the Undercity. So this is actually another interesting panel. All of the members of the Covenant are meditating together, using the force to find the fleeing Padawan as Lucian patiently awaits. Lucian is the de facto leader of the Covenant, but he doesn't share their clairvoyance in the force. In their view of the force, working with a group of Jedi who can see vivid visions of the future, he is separate from them, an outsider, even in his own home. This is only solidified by his character's full arc. Make sure to check out the rest of our placement videos for future details on that. Thus concludes this week's issue of Knights of the Old Republic. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. I apologize for the comic issues being like super late, but real world is, you know, burning and society is collapsing all around us. However, I've actually been busier than I've ever been in my entire life, so, but I have some future projects coming up that I'm really, really excited about and I'm hoping that I can find some help with. I may actually have to pass on some editing duties to somebody else for the channel if anybody else is interested. I'm going to try and see if I can't get some of my fellow Barb's Basement captives to maybe edit down some of the audio for me because that is actually the longest part of the editing process is simply calling down the audio. Uh, the actual animation of these pages is actually something I'm quite familiar with since I, I edit on a regular basis. So the editing portion of the pages and like animating the comic panels and making them come to life is something that I'm very comfortable with, but the audio is what takes just so long. So hopefully next week I'll be able to have another video up for you guys. I'm, I'm really going to try to keep these uploads consistent. I really, really like working on Bar's Basement stuff. It's like my, my passion project. It's where I get out all my creative juices because a lot of what I film is like very stiff talking head interviews for businesses and stuff like that. That's not so much fun. So I definitely want to keep up Bar's Basement. So if you guys like the videos, if you guys want to keep seeing my content, make sure that you you like and subscribe and all that, and like, uh, yada, 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 whatever. And uh, make sure you comment. Commenting really, really helps up the channel grow. And I can't wait to make another video and see you guys again.